Good afternoon and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Nolan Williams will present Using Rapid Acting Brain Stimulation for Treatment Resistant Depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $418 million to fund more than 6,000 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Nolan Williams. Dr. Williams is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University Medical Center. He is a 2016 and 2018 Young Investigator grantee and was the 2019 Clearman Prize winner for exceptional clinical research. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Williams' presentation. This will be followed by question and answers. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel. Feel free to ask your questions at any time using the panel. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Williams. Nolan, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for your introduction, Jeff. And uh, really great to uh, to be here. So looking forward to, to giving this talk. Um, just uh, trying to get my, my slides up. Okay. All right, great. So today I'll be speaking about a, um, a method that we've been developing at Stanford, which we, we term Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. Um, I'm a scientific advisor for a couple of companies. Um, so I'm going to give background for neuromodulation for depression in general and then talk uh, more specifically about something called data burst stimulation and then uh, and then even more specifically about this uh, methodology that we've been working on. So just to, to kind of contextualize this, we'll be thinking about depression as a, a disorder of, um, of aberrant um, neural connectivity. So this idea that um, psychiatric and some neurological conditions are, are conditions of of abnormal connectivity um, in the brain. Uh, specifically talking about uh, this methodology and its application to um, major depressive disorder and, and mood disorders uh, more generally, um, although I think that this, uh, we think this method is applicable to a wide range of um, neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, what's important to understand about why going after major depression um, for a rapid anchoring method makes sense is because uh, you know the the prevalence is so so great with this with MDD you know about a fifth of folks in the US um, experience uh, depression at some point and it's a leading cause of disability and about a third of people don't respond to conventional treatments and um, you know one of the things that I'll be highlighting as we go along is just how uh, a critical um, BBRF and NARSAD have been in um, in some of the early findings that have led to some of the insights um, that ultimately led to this um, to this method. And so, um, Alan Schatzberg and um, and co-authors um, demonstrated back in 2007 that uh, that depression is a condition where, um, in in the case of this particular paper. Um, there's abnormal connectivity, increased connectivity between the subgenual anterior cingulate and the default mode network, <clears throat> and that'll make sense later as we keep as we keep going. Um, and uh, you know, as we as we start to treat um, depression, uh, we go through a series of, of standard med uh, medication steps, and we get to some point where we're establishing true treatment-resistant depression and not some medical condition causing depressive symptoms. 
when we start using uh, more and more um, types of meds that are that are not just the the standard uh, SSRI uh, based drugs, and we get to some point where we uh, we've we've seen that the patients failed those um, those augmenting agents, so those uh, more rare um, anti oral antidepressant drugs, and we start thinking about things like ketamine and uh, electroconvulsive therapy and RTMS, and uh, and there hasn't really been a good algorithm worked out on how to how to treat folks at this point which which of those interventions are the right intervention to start with um, but and this is kind of where we're at in 2021 as far as uh, as far as it goes um, for treating people that are pretty you know severely treatment resistant um, depression is quite disabling um, I, I like to use this slide I borrowed it um, from from a, from a friend David Carrion um, demonstrating that uh, People with moderate depression, the, it's uh, just as disabling as um, as having a heart attack, and severe depression is just as disabling as dying of cancer without treatment. Um, and and that's a good kind of context to understand this, and to understand that that really um, you know we're, we're pretty underfunded for such a disabling condition, and and um, and why. Um, you know why work uh, in 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 funding this sort of thing uh, by by groups like NARSAD is so important. Um, you know, so medication is insufficient for about a third of folks, and um, there's a particularly interesting scenario, an unfortunate scenario in psychiatry, where um, as you increase the acuity of a psychiatric uh, of psychiatric care, you actually lose. Um, lose options which is very different than the rest of medicine where as you increase the acuity of neurological care or cardiac care or whatever it may be you actually increase the number of tests and the number of treatments but in psychiatry we um we hospitalize about a half a million people a year for suicidal depression and um and they get into the hospital and they lose the ability to get conventional or tms in most cases they lose the ability to get things like S-ketamine or IV ketamine they lose the ability to get um, a lot of these biological treatments that are outpatient actually in 90 percent of, of cases they actually lose the ability to get ECT because ECT is only available in about 10 percent of U.S. psychiatric hospitals so <clears throat> they lose the ability to get um, a higher acuity treatment and uh, and you know we don't have much in the way of additional sorts of testing in psychiatry beyond beyond the utility of additional the additional observation uh, possibilities in the inpatient unit and it's no surprise in that context that uh, the highest peak incidence of suicide um, is in the the period of time immediately after a hospitalization and it's the number one kind of you want to think about this modif modifiable risk factor for for suicide attempt and completion is is um, is hospital admission, right? And so um, so you know taking a look at this and thinking about you know just just the complexity that that we all see is treating um, psychiatrists every day of folks sitting in um, in emergency room hallways and not being able to get um, not be able to even get into a, a hospital bed because the hospitals are so overloaded it's really as i as we kind of saw it uh it's really the um the fact that we haven't built treatments for this problem we haven't really created treatments that allow for us to to be able to address this psychiatric emergency setting ect is the closest thing but it's really you know vastly underutilized and it's use over the last several decades hasn't really increased and um you know there there are candidates for this you know uh ketamine s ketamine are candidates um and and you know we took took the approach that uh, maybe there's a way of of building a neuromodulation candidate for this and um, you know it's really under the kind of framework and idea of asking the question of can mental health treatments be designed and not just uh, serendipitously discovered, right? Can we can we build a treatment, maybe one that actually also reflects the neurobiology of the of the process, 
that's going on with depression? Can we can we build a treatment um, you know, for this? Uh, the first iteration of, of that way of thinking um, stemmed from another um, BBRF uh, young investigator um, awardee, uh, Mark George, uh, my my mentor from Charleston for my research fellowship back um, back in residency and, and fellowship, uh, and and still till to till today. Um, and he he was uh, awarded uh, a young investigator award to really investigate this insight that he had um, in the early to mid 90s where where he saw that um, if you do repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation of motor cortex and you're able to to increase the cortical excitability of motor cortex and he paired that idea with this idea that uh, as he was he was observing in Bob Post's lab that there was a hypo metabolism hypoactivity in the um, prefrontal cortices in the left uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and what, whether or not one could use um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, this, this um, ut you know, utilization of Faraday's law to increase brain activity in an area where brain activity was uh, reduced, right? And, uh, you know, the initial pilot study looked good and um, there was a kind of stepwise level um, increase in the knowledge of of how to use this technique over time. So kind of small increases in number of days and, and intensity and pulses um, produced, um, you know, small amounts of increases in the, um, in the efficacy of the approach over time. And slowly the, the single daily repetitive RTMS approach um, evolved into what um, ended up being the FDA approved approach. And um, this is kind of the schedule on the right hand side and the parameters on the left hand side. And so, um, you know, TMS once a day, five days a week for six weeks, and one is able to, um, you know, achieve uh, depression improvement um, in, you know, remission in about a third of people in open label studies and uh, about 50% uh, of people um, achieving responder status in open label studies with, um, you know, with, with this approach developed out of the knowledge of the mid nineties, right. Um, with, with slow kind of evolution of, of the parameter space over time. So um, using, um, you know, ruler-based methods to, to measure head position, you know, skull position of coil, and giving uh, you know a, a derivation of those initial motor physiology studies as far as um, producing changes in cortical excitability that ultimately would yield uh, antidepressant effects, and um, you know it's quite durable uh, for folks that are um, responders. Um, and then you know kind of a, a second uh, improvement is this idea that um, that we can use um, physiology-based um, stimulation approaches, so something called theta burst stimulation, where you could give um, a much more efficient form of stimulation uh, for a given session. So same schedule, five days a week for six weeks, but could we use um, the, the rhythms of, of the brain to stimulate with instead of using um, something that's just kind of been been discovered based off of parametric testing, which was the first, you know, iteration of this, and so, and so that was kind of how Theta Burst was born. Was this idea that you could put hippocampal rhythms into a TMS coil, and you could also change cortical excitability. What's really interesting about um, about this is you're giving uh, you're giving this kind of burst of three pulses at 50 hertz every fifth of a second uh, for two seconds within. Uh, eight second inner train interval and mimicking um, the hippocampal um, signaling and it changes in that case intermittent theta burst changes cortical excitability it makes the cortex uh, motor cortex more excitable when you do that and um, and if you compare it to conventional rtms you can get it done what you can get uh, what normally took 37 minutes to get done done in three minutes and you can do it with a fifth of the number of pulses 
there's a group in out of Taiwan that that uh, instead of giving it over six weeks, gave it over two weeks, and we're able to show a separation from sham um, with the with the uh, with the two week um, approach. This is the six week non inferiority study that was published in the Lancet. Again, just kind of laying this out that uh, you know BBF BBRF uh, awardees, um, you know, were folks who had laid out some of these initial insights. So this is this is uh, Jeff Daskalaskis and uh, Danny Bloomberger. Um, working on this particular project, and this resulted in FDA approval for single daily intermittent theta bursts, so once a day, five days a week for six weeks. And this is the FDA approved parameters, again, showing that this pulse potency is, you know, comparing it to conventional RTMS, you know, the, the number of pulses that it takes to, to produce this antidepressant effect is, um, is much less, so, you know, it's 5X potent. And um, the number that's important here is 18,000 pulses. So 18,000 pulses is a six-week course of the FDA-approved conventional conventional intermittent theta burst um, approach that was approved in 2018. And again, just showing that it's the same schedule, but um, but you can get it done faster um, with this particular application. So you can actually get um, many more patients treated on the same device each day, but doesn't really change, it may make it a little more convenient for folks, but doesn't really change the speed or efficacy at all of, of, of the approach, just simply the amount of time in chair. And so we, we looked at all of this back in uh, 2015, 2016, and had kind of a different take on it and said, well, you know, there's, there's certainly health economic um, uh, benefits to being able to get, um, to get more people in a chair, but what if instead of using ThetaBurst to get more people in a chair, we could use ThetaBurst to get more treatment in a given individual in a period of time, right? Can we, can we treat people rapidly with an approach like this? And so we, we were in kind of a similar sort of set of experimental engineering conditions as, um, as Mark was back in, in the mid-90s in the sense of thinking through all the parameters set and how we would do this. And the first you know, insight was that uh, 1,800 pulses of intermittent theta burst um, applied, um, applied um, it, at 90% of the resting motor threshold produces the greatest change in the motor evoke potential, the greatest change in cortical excitability. That same uh, pulse dose um, as I was saying earlier, when given um, once a day, five days a week for two weeks, separates from sham um, compared to, um, you know, to a to a sham form of of, uh, of ITBS. And then if you if you think about these initial conditions in which TMS was um, was developed, it was really developed in this context of our TMS devices were brand new. They, they it broke down all the time. They um, it was very difficult to get a whole session in, even, and so you know a lot of that drove this idea of giving TMS once a day. As you know, in addition, you know, folks were worried about you know seizure risk and all that sort of thing. We really didn't know what the um, what the potential was for um, producing seizures in people after giving multiple sessions per. Per day, but if you look at the basic science, what you'll see is that learning optimally happens not at 24 hours between each session, but at around an hour between each session. And so, if you think about it, it makes a whole lot of sense. If you think about cramming for a big test, you know, uh, once a day stimulation is like going to class every day. Um, but if you're really trying to study to to kind of get it done, you want to be able to um, you want to be able to see the same piece of information once once an hour, let's say, and so that's that's called space learning. And if you if you think about what you would do with note cards, you wouldn't write one note card out and look at it 50 times and then put that note card down and never look at it again. What you do is you'd write out 60 note cards. You'd look at each note card once an hour, every hour, and you just keep going through the note card deck until you'd seen that note card, let's say, about 50 times. And for a lot of people, that was enough. That's enough for them to to memorize the information. And that's based off of this idea of space learning. We can do this by stimulating a hippocampal slices and looking at dendritic spine enlargement. And what we see is that if you stimulate and you wait 60 
minutes and you stimulate again, you can produce um, an increase in the size of some spines and the priming of some spines. So you can um, iteratively increase the number of um, enlarged dendritic spines. And this is this is kind of a, a kind of a fundamental neuroscience principle that guided us in the timing of our stimulation. Uh, people were able to produce a similar sort of experiment with motor cortex physiology and, and show a similar sort of thing that if you did 15 minute intercession interval, you really didn't see much change in cortical excitability. You really needed to wait at least 30 minutes to be able to have an, an interval increase in the amount of excitability. And uh, another another insight um, that that folks had had um, discovered over the course of the last couple of years, and Mark and others were, you know, were on this paper, is this idea that in the brain sway, uh, pivotal trial, if they took folks um, who did not meet responder status with um, with the course of um, the blinded course of RTMS um, for depression, and they simply just kept giving them more sessions after the the trial was over, what they found was that there was a dose response sort of scenario where as we as the the dose was increased, they were able to demonstrate that there was um, an increase in the number of responders and eventually a plateau, giving this hint that we haven't really fully done what we've done in pharmacology for for all of the the drugs that we we use, which is to give, you know, a pulse uh, dose response curve sort of experiment. The third piece of information kind of in this new set of engineering conditions that's emerged since the mid 90s and since the FDA approval even is this idea that um, that we're not just stimulating in a named brain region, but rather we're stimulating into a network. Um, when we thought about how we were going to approach this one of the things that was really evident was that the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex really has the bulk of the clinical trial data as far as efficacy goes. Um, a, a guy by the name of Mike Fox, a neurologist at Harvard, has been working on this, this idea of, of network localization, and he's done it in a couple of very interesting ways. One of the ways is that he takes stroke lesions that cause a given behavioral um, symptom, and then he takes all those stroke lesions and he puts it, overlaps it over the human connectome map, and then asks the question of which of these, um, is there a common uh, brain region that all of these lesions are functionally connected to? And he did it first in kind of hard neurological conditions that are hard to argue with, like uh, post-stroke um, Hemi Korea hemibolismus, and he was able to show um, that you know th th this is kind of a known movement disorder that happens after stroke. And in my neurology training, I was taught that this was um, this was due to subthalamic nucleus strokes, and in about a third of cases, it is. But um, if you take all those subthalamic nucleus strokes and any other stroke that causes Hemi Korea hemibolismus, and you put it in the human connectome map, and you ask the question of what or what is uh, the functional uh, connection that all of these lesions are, are, um, are related to. In this case, it's the posterior lateral putamen. And then if you go, well, maybe that's just something that happens with all post-stroke movement disorders. So they did this with post-stroke asterixis, the second most common movement disorder, and they didn't see it. it. It localized to a totally different brain region, suggesting this is very specific. And then they did it again with a new set of lesions and showed the same thing. So this is very specific to this particular um, condition this particular movement disorder. So they did this with um, with depression lesions, right? So lesions anywhere in the brain that cause depression, put it over the human connectome map and ask the question of um, what are these all functionally connected to? And what they found was that in five data sets, they were all functionally connected to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that wasn't the case in, in controls, it, which, which, you know, in, supports this, this general kind of oversimplified idea that um, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex regulates this deep structure of subgenual anterior cingulate in normal mood with depression. Um, and again, this is kind of oversimplified for the purposes of illustration. It's, it's, it's certainly going to be more complicated than this. Um, in depression, the subgenual anterior cingulate is overactive and the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is unable to regulate it. 
and TMS really regulates um, the left uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex subgenual anterior cingulate um, uh, connection, right? So it 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 upregulates left DLPFC and downregulates the subgenual anterior cingulate hyper um, activity and, and re restores mood. Um, there's this. There's been uh, I think five um, five studies now looking looking at this idea um, derived from this first first paper um, illustrated here, where if you place the TMS coil in a, in a standard skull spot, and then you ask the question of um, how close is that standard skull spot to this ideal uh, DLPFC subgenual connection, this area where the DLPFC um, regulates the subgenual anterior cingulate, what, um, what they found is the proximity of the coil to that ideal spot is linearly related to the improvement in the depression score. And if the coil is, is superimposed over any given spot, it, the, the degree of anti-correlation is linearly related to the, um, the, the antidepressant improvement, suggesting that, um, that this, is, um, this is the, or a uh, target for, um, you know, for depression within the the great the kind of larger left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that we've been thinking about, and like I said, this has been now demonstrated five times, um, replicated by multiple groups, and it seems to really hold. And so, what we've been looking at is we've been looking at this idea that we can uh, parcelate. Um, areas within the, um, the region of interest, so the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the subgenual anterior cingulate, and use hierarchical clustering to, to cluster similarly behaving uh, voxels. And then we apply a um, decision algorithm to this so that we're able to uh, use the subgenual anterior cingulate um, anti-correlation within the context of the stimulation approach that we are um, we are interested in uh, applying. Um, and that outputs to a particular spot within the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where the TMS coil is approximated, and that spot is utilized in this protocol. So this idea that we're able to use, um, use a personalized target and we're able to use um, a stimulation approach um, that we that we've seen and we believe to be a rapid acting one. So we give 90% of the resting motor threshold with depth adjustment um, with 1,800 uh, pulses of the conventional RT, um, ITBS um, stimulation approach, uh, one session a day, um, every day uh, uh, we give 10 sessions uh, total and uh, we give that for five days. So um, it's a, a session every 60 minutes uh, for 10 hours a day for five days. And so that's the schedule on the right, um, and that that schedule is is basically seven ish in the morning to around five at night, uh, five days a week. And what we're doing is in this low lower left um, panel, we're we're doing a dose response curve. So we're giving um, we're giving a certain amount of dose, and we think that in the right target, and we think that with placing coil on the right target, giving the right dose and a neuro uh, a neurophysiologically neuroscience informed stimulation parameter we're able to 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 do this sort of dose response curve that that we've needed to do with TMS in time and this is really kind of the the idea is um, it's it's a uh, a stimulation approach and it's a targeting methodology that that is what um, this this accelerated protocol um, is we've published this uh, twice now, so we've published it in Brain and published it in the American Journal. The Brain letter was the first publication. Um, you know, this is this is a whole lot of stimulation. It's 18,000 pulses per um, day, and so that's the equivalent of a six-week course of intermittent theta burst. And so, to kind of ethically justify giving this much stimulation in a day, we needed to do it in people that were quite severe, so people who had failed. Conventional RTMS, people who'd failed ECT, people who'd failed, um, you know, some of them had failed ketamine, some of them were on the DBS um, trial list, the, the, you know, that level of severity, and uh, and kind of met Helen Mayberg's um, deep brain stimulation 
kind of clinical criteria. And what we found is we found a really dramatic but unsustained effect. And so people would get better into the remission range, into a range of mood improvement that they had really never experienced in the last you know, 20 or 30 years of their life. Um, but then they, they relapsed out of it pretty quickly. And a lot of people said, oh, well, it's really obvious what's going on there. It's, it's uh, you know, those folks had gotten, um, gotten some sort of placebo effect and then they, they, you know, left out of the trial and the placebo effect wore off. Um, you know, I had seen this sort of, you know, this sort of graph before in people that had uh, failed, I'm sorry, had 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 um, epidural cortical stimulation, stimulation implants and had been in a situation where they'd gotten these implants and they had um, had their battery um, tripped off by a metal detector. So they were doing well. And then, you know, it was in the, in the era where, um, you know, these implant batteries didn't have magnetic shielding. So they'd go through the, the airport magnetic shielding and they would um, have the, the battery turned off um, unbeknownst to them. They'd come back from vacation, they'd be um, severely depressed which really kind of informed us that we thought this was really working, but also, you know, in this context kind of shows that, you know, people this severe really need more continuous sort of stimulation. And um, this is work um, also uh, funded by, um, by NARSAD. Um, this was the uh, Ziad Nahas' Independent Investigator uh, Award a number of years ago that had funded this epidural cortical stimulation approach that I'd worked on during my research fellowship and really, you know, was the basis for a lot of the ideas for, for this approach. And it's, um, it's this idea that, um, that if you stimulate in, in left or lateral prefrontal cortex continuously with an implanted device, you're able to produce a pretty robust um, antidepressant effect chronically and a similar sort of level of treatment resistance to the, to the group that I had demonstrated um, earlier. This is a different group of people that had an implant but suggesting that maybe we were doing a similar sort of thing in these really severe um, folks. And, and really this idea that maybe non-invasive and invasive brain stimulation could actually inform each other methodologically, but kind of getting back to, to, this, um, to this Stanford method, you know, we, we, we did this in these really, really severe folks, um, took the chance at, at taking on, you know, really stimulating a whole lot in the day, didn't see much, in the way of side effects, you know, the occasional headache, and then we decided to treat people who were, you know, a little more severe. First, starting out with people who'd failed RTMS, and then transitioning into people who, you know, had failed a number of meds. You know, about a third of folks had failed seven or seven to ten or more meds. Um, and, you know, in that group, we were able to show something um, quite interesting, which is that um, if you look at the percent change after the first day. Um, you see a um, you see similar to what you see with conventional RTMS, about a 30% improvement on average. But if you just keep going and giving more and more dose over time, you pick up more and more remitters. And um, you know we had a durable effect in these folks out to the month mark. If you look at TMS naive versus TMS failing folks, you get to the same place, but the dose that you need is different and the durability is different, suggesting again this idea that as you get into more treatment resistance, you need more and more dose. And we did these, these sorts of experiments, giving people two weeks, uh, and this is unpublished data too, giving people two weeks and, and extending the durability of this effect, really reflecting this idea that, um, that maybe what, what it is is a, a, dose, a dose effect as well with pulse dose. If you treat and retreat folks, you can get them to the same place and it's pretty similar sort of trajectory. And if you look at the position of the target as it relates, um, of any individual's given target as it relates to the standard F3 target, you know, we're very surprised to see that it was spatially um, separated quite a bit. Um, you know, initially, I think there was a, a thought that maybe you know, the targets would, would surround this more standard target, uh, but that's not what we saw. There was a pretty uh, pretty big difference uh, in a lot of folks um, where these are individual subjects, targets put on an average kind of standard brain and then the F3 um, electrode position on an average brain. 
And then, you know, if you look at some of these folks are quite far away from the standard position. So then, um, you know, now now we've uh, completed a randomized control trial that that um, you know randomized control trial is done, and in this you know the the process of going through the the paper um, submission process, it's um, you know 22 to 80 year old uh, folks only MDD in this case only moderate to severe uh, acuity and moderate to severe treatment resistance as measured on the the, the severity on the Hamilton and Madras and the uh, treatment resistance on, on something called the Maudsley refractoriness scale. We excluded, you know, the standard stuff, excluded people with RTMS exposure and people with um, non-response ECT, not because we didn't think we could um, treat those folks, but because of the rapid, um, you know, relapse that we'd seen with folks um, with, that, with that level of severity of uh, treatment resistance. And we found that this was uh, a, an efficacious treatment um, our primary was percent change at one month, um, and uh, this is our consort diagram. So about 30 folks, two had um, been excluded um, due to um, after randomization, but um, before any kind of stimulation. One um, one didn't just decided they didn't want to be a blinded trial. The other one had uh, we, we discovered on MRI that, that, that this individual had a uh, whole brain radiation, um, evidence of whole brain radiation, and then um, then we kind of confronted the, that individual and took them out. Um, and then uh, and then in the uh, the, the folks that, that were brought in, 30 folks, one was excluded from the analysis um, as this individual wasn't transparent about their diagnoses. Um, so 14 in the active group, 15 in the sham group. Uh, pretty severe folks, so about half of them were unemployed at enrollment, um, about nine years in the current episode, about, you know, 25 years or so duration of illness lifetime, you know, five meds, uh, plus or minus two uh, lifetime trials, um, mid, kind of mid-30s, uh, moderate score, and, um, and so quite a, quite a severe, um, you know, cohort of folks. And this was our finding. So really dramatic differences between active and sham. Uh, our effect sizes, depending upon if you're looking at percent change or or um, or score change, 1.4 to 1.9. And uh, if you look at individual trajectories, what you see is really interesting. Is nearly everybody, uh, other than this one uh, person in light blue, um, you know, had uh, a, a change at some point in the four week. Follow up, 78.5% of those folks, um, you know, were within moderate remission criteria at some point within the four-week follow-up, and only about 13% um, in the sham group. Uh, most of those guys with um, pretty flat lines. Um, so really, really quite a dramatic difference between groups. And this is not a non-inferiority study. So this is meant simply just to give kind of a, a sense of things that um, you know, really much more. A rapid effect than what you see with esketamine and an ECT. Um, you know, and the targets were pretty dispersed relative to the F3 electrode. And really, the only difference in uh, in the groups as far as side effects was headache. Uh, a lot of us thought that maybe the fatigue uh, that people experienced from doing this was due to the stimulation approach, but really, it looks like it's really just due to to being there all week. Um, and, and the the headache did not unblind people, so the the blind was completely intact. The guessing was intact. Like the p value of the difference between the two groups is like 0.8 or 0.9 or something. I mean, it was like they really kind of strikingly couldn't guess, um, you know, which group they were in. We 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 looked at some suicidal inpatients. So folks, this is pilot data, unblinded um, pilot data, just to show you proof of concept for this idea that we can treat people that are this, um, that, that are in that that clinical context that I was describing earlier. So people that, that are in this most, you know, uh, vulnerable time of their life, they're coming into the psychiatric hospital with suicidal depression. In this case, many of them had, had been in the hospital with, you know, probably suicidal depression, um, depression of some sort uh, previously. So about, um, you know, two, uh, hospitalizations previous to this, the, the, the current hospitalization that they were being, um, that they were being treated under about 1.5 suicide attempts lifetime, um, you know, prior to being enrolled in the study, this pilot study. So quite, 
uh, quite severe folks from a suicide attempt kind of hospitalization standpoint, a number of them had ECT and conventional RTMS before. Um, and this is what we saw. So this is not a non-inferiority study to ECT, but this is post hoc matching, but this is just to give folks a sense of, um, you know, the relative speed in particular that this is happening in, right? So we're able to see in people matched for entry severity and level of treatment resistance, you know, a, a, a much more rapid uh, effect of this compared to, to, to ECT. And then if you look at suicide scores, a really dramatic um, reduction in, in the Beck scale for suicidal ideation. So within, you know, six is thought to be the clinically relevant threshold. So within the first to second day, you know, a lot of people, um, their SI is, is pretty much gone. And, in, and this is also a little biased in the sense that we only followed people that had a, a remission at, at the immediate post, but in the people that did remit, you see a, um, you see a pretty durable anti-suicide effect out for, for uh, six months. Um, this is uh, this is our, our group. Um, this is pre um, pre COVID, so we haven't been able to take a picture since uh, since uh, COVID's happened. So uh, definitely some new faces in this uh, crowd, and really thankful to all the folks in my group for um, for being involved with this and, and getting getting this work off the ground. And really um, a big thanks to um, the Brain Behavior uh, Foundation for um, and, and those NARSAD Young Investigator Awards for really believing in an idea like this and really, um, you know, being the first, um, you know, uh, of the groups to really fund um, this work and to, to NIMH for um, carrying on that funding torch has really been very helpful over the last year, year and a half to fund two R01s to explore this work both in, in uh, inpatients and in outpatients, uh, looking at uh, neuroimaging um, outcomes of, of this sort of stimulation. Um, so with that, I will, I will wrap up and um, yeah, looking forward to, to answering any questions. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, excellent presentation about obviously very exciting work that, that you've been doing um, I, I guess a, a question uh, that I have, and you, you touched upon it, is the um, is the suicidal ideation, given the, the the concerns we all have about suicide risk and depression. Um, and you spoke about it let, really for those who remit with the treatment, um, it lasting for six months. What what you know? What do you view as the ongoing course of treatment for people, whether it be right after the initial treatment or even six months to a year down the road? Yeah, I think that's the big next step that we have to, to tackle, right? Which in, in your, you're spot on in asking that question, which is that, um, you know, in some people we get these, you know, these quick relapses, right? And folks that are, that are quite treatment resistant, that have failed a lot of, a lot of things. And so I, I see it as two, two general roads. You know, there's three you know, with three roads, two two that that are um, responses after somebody would, would relapse, and so you've got the folks. We had a number of these folks where you know younger people, not really that treatment resistant. We treated them, and they got a year or more out of this. And I think that a, an acute course every year. I mean, I ha we have one one particular patient who's come in, you know, on her spring her spring break every spring break through college and you know, gets a week during the spring break and goes a whole year of college, you know, and you know, a month or so before, you know, she's about to come in to get treated again. She starts to feel a little depressed again. We bring her back and she gets another year, right? Um, and so I think this kind of five day move is gonna be um, something that would be enough for those sorts of folks. And what percentage of the pie that is, it's still a little hard to know because we haven't, you know, we haven't done enough you know, and we haven't done enough subjects to really get a, a total sense of that, I'd say. Um, the, the second group is going to be a group where, you know, similar to ECT, there's going to need to be some sort of maintenance protocol, right? Where you give an acute course, you know, like we do with ECT, maybe in an inpatient hospital setting, 
and then the the second um, the second kind of move is some sort of maintenance protocol triggered off of some sort of you know it could be physicians could be it could be symptoms it could be you know sophisticated monitoring or all of those things you know and you use some combination of those things to trigger retreatment you know hopefully eventually pre-symptomatically but you're probably in the in the early stages at a point in which there's some symptomatic worsening but not at the level that they were when they were necessitated hospitalization because then obviously they'd need to go back in the hospital again and the goal of all of this is very similar to the goal of of, of dialysis right in the sense of we we hosp you know we hospitalize people for for dialysis once and then we we end up um not needing to in in, in compliant patients really not needing to hospitalize for that person again for dialysis they go to a dialysis center they get some dialysis that's enough to you know to, to keep them um you know keep them kind of at a place where they don't need to go back in the hospital and i'd see you know the ma a maintenance protocol is similar to that right we, we develop a maintenance protocol you know people you know in this kind of dream where we could treat a, a substantial amount of people in a clinical context like this you know you could treat people um acutely and then you know hopefully you could keep people out of the hospital with ongoing treatment and in our data look the, the the data that we have about retreating and about retreatment efficacy looks quite good um and so this idea that we could do that for for a fair amount of these folks is there and then the third the third kind of branch point is that group that we treated right at the beginning the people who failed ect and all that that had relapsed so quickly and I think um, a version of what um, what Ziad had envisioned um, with his uh, independent investigator grant um, a number of years ago, you know, um, where we're using these stimulation approaches um, and we're using um, this sort of target, and we're able to instead of using uh, you know a magnet, we're doing direct electrical stim, but we're able to do the same exact sort of thing, you know, from the brain's perception of it. And um, and have an implant that's running, you know, all the time. And I, I think that I think those are the three roads, you know, in which, um, you know, if if we had the ability to have all those, we'd we'd probably have a continuum of care that spanned across, you know, everybody past a certain level of of severity. You know, I don't know what that level, you know, what that that line is, but certainly on the high end, you know, everybody at the most severe fringes, you know, and so that's. You know that that's kind of the dream. Um, it'll it'll take some time to get there, but I think that's that's how you you could keep everybody well. Um, thank you for the, for that uh, really thoughtful approach to this. Want to and I want to emphasize for everybody listening that when you're talking about severe, these are people who have not responded to multiple treatments, um, and I just want to emphasize that. And as sort of a lead into my next question. How about for people who haven't had other treatments, who maybe would prefer something other than medicine um, to treat their depression? Where do you see this in the sort of in the spectrum of, of treatment um, for for the broader population of, of people who may have depression? Yeah, it's a, it's another great question. So we we treated um, one completely. Um, med naive uh, gentleman on the, on the inpatient pilot that I was describing earlier. And, um, you know, he had a severe suicide attempt um, and, uh, and you know, he's quite ill. So his modular score was in the 40s, I think, or something like that. But he never, you know, he, he was, um, you know, he'd moved to the U.S. from another country and really didn't have access to mental health um, and just did kind of just gotten here. And so, so he, um, you know, he was somebody who looked quite bad, but but was really you know quite naive and and uh, and we treated him and he was well in six hours, so it didn't take the whole you know three four or five days or anything like that. I mean he was totally stone cold normal in like six hours, which is really dramatic. We've seen this with some bipolar one patients that we've piloted too, um, you know, and it suggests to me that in these less treatment resistant folks that you you may not need 
you know, we, we biased towards giving like a lot of stimulation because we were going after these figs that failed, failed ECT and ketamine and all this stuff. But you, you may have more of a ketamine sort of time frame in the more treatment naive folks where you could get it done in a day. And, you know, and I, and I, and I think that if you could get it done in a day for those, those people, and it's not the whole five days or whatnot, if, if, if that is true, and, and there's a lot of work to figure that out too, obviously, then, then I think it, it, you know, it brings this question on of, if, if could you do this, you know, in, in a potentially in a treatment naive population, particularly in the sort of treatment naive populations that we've treated with ECT, right, where they're coming in and they're, they're treatment naive, but they're quite severe and they needed hospitalization. And I think that's a, a group of people that, that this makes a whole lot of sense for. If you start extending into, um, you know, into people, non-hospitalized people that are treatment naive, you know, it's, it's an open question. And those, as you, as you know, those are hard studies um, to run because of the, the potential for placebo effect. Um, but but it, it brings on this question of, if we take this stuff as seriously as we do, you know, in that slide I gave at the beginning, dying of cancer and, uh, without treatment and a heart attack and all that sort of thing, you know, and combine that with this idea that um, that in folks that are, you know, quite severe, even if they're treatment naive, you know, that it's affecting their jobs and their lives and they really need to get back to being well really quickly, you know, it, it would make sense to think about it in, in that context. I, I think from my perspective, for, for the trials that are directly in front of us doing this in, uh, in people that are treatment resistant makes sense because of the placebo question. And, and, and so I think we have to keep kind of going down that road for now. But, but yeah, I mean, it, I, think, I think if we could get some traction, get an approval on this thing eventually, and, uh, and be able to, you know, to do this in more, more severe folks, it, it really opens the question with such a low side effect burden of, of who we could expand it to. So. Um, good. Thank you. And you, you mentioned bipolar and we, we know that for um, people who have bipolar disorder, often the, the depression, especially if it's treatment resistant, can be the, the, the most difficult part of the disorder and most risky in terms of suicide risk. Um, could you talk a little bit about this for people with bipolar depression? Absolutely, yeah. So we've treated in that, uh, both in the Brain Letter and in the American Journal, um, open label um, on a study, we, um, we treated folks with, um, with uh, bipolar 2 and didn't see any treatment emergent mania. In the RCT, uh, just to keep it homogeneous, we, we didn't take people with bipolar depression. We only took MDD folks. Um, you know, we have some funding now to, to look at bipolar depression, and I certainly think that that's, uh, that's on the horizon. It's, you know, we've treated a couple of, you know, and this is unpublished data that we, we just need to publish, basically. We treated a couple of bipolar 1 folks with this, we um, with with the bipolar two and the MDD folks, if they remit, we kept treating them after remission. Uh, I got very nervous about that idea with bipolar one folks, particularly because of the speed in which some of them were remitting, um, you know, single days or less. Um, and so we just treated them to the point in which they were better and then stopped. We need to publish that data. It's it's a it's a question of if is this in that small group we really didn't see any, you know, overt treatment emergent mania. We we saw some you know small upticks in the Yale in the in the YMRS and we um we ended up uh <clears throat> we ended up kind of switching to to bilateral high you know uh right ITBS or or stopping in those scenarios. Um but it you know it, it opens this question. It's a it's a harder study to do and opens this question of how do you do it in those folks. And that really is um that's really part of, of the next steps that the lab needs to take in, in trying to figure out how to expand this to bipolar depression. Um, great, thank you. And let me take it one step further. What other conditions are, would you envision um, benefiting from, from this approach as well? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually, I'll, I didn't include it in here, but I'll show a quick slide. Um, Carolyn Rodriguez and I um, just published a small a small pilot in obsessive compulsive disorder um, that 
uh, has looked, you know, really good. It's uh, <clears throat> it's a um, it's only seven folks, so it's not like it's a huge number of people that we were able to um, treat. But in a number of them, they actually went into OCD remission range, and that was uh, that was pretty um, that was pretty surprising for us. You know, three of them ended up uh, you know going into this range where they were not um, were no longer um, you know symptomatic from OCD at all um, and so that's uh, that was quite um, that was quite exciting and and we've got some money to do that in a bigger way um, there, there's been a little bit of work around generalized anxiety disorder um, and uh, and that looks like that could be promising as well um, so that's you know really early as well um, but uh, <clears throat> But that you know, right-sided um, ITBS for that, and so that's uh, that's kind of in the horizon. But really, I think any any condition in which there is a um, in which there's a, a cortical component to it, where you could actually stimulate you know in in a cortical um, area that's accessible to um, TMS, I think that you'd be able to to have have the ability to um to to treat it if you knew um you know kind of what the target was and and which directionality you need to push the system into whether it be you know inhibiting or exciting that area well thank you nolan i could go on for for the next hour um but obviously our time is going to be running out and i just want to Thank you for an outstanding presentation and just as importantly, more importantly, for the work that you've done on this. It provides tremendous hope for so many people who may be suffering in the way that you described how severe the depression can be for people. It really provides hope um, for, for them to be able to live full, healthy lives. So thank you for all that you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that, that's it's really yeah, I really appreciate those comments. And yeah, that's that's our goal. We're just trying to, you know, find find some you know ways of of, uh, of giving folks hope uh, that we're we're kind of in an era. I think we're we're going to make some big um, strides in this in this space. So, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Anthony Ruoco, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto will present, what are we learning about brain biology and borderline personality disorder? This webinar will take place on Tuesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Take care.